So everybody, welcome to my introduction to analysis services. Uh, my name is Oskar Gunnarsson. I uh, have a company called North Insights, which is a, a consulting company which I own. Um, my connection details, you know, uh, you have my Twitter handle there. Um, I have a slide here, which is uh, my information. Uh, I'm not going to read through it. You will get the slide so you can go on and, and, and read this uh, uh, if you want uh, and get in touch. So I come from Iceland. Uh, beside that, let's just dive into it. So the agenda for today is uh, what we are going to talk about what analysis service is. We are going to talk about what in what flavors and versions does it come, and then in what version do you choose. So basically, this is a uh, beginner session where we will talk about you know just broadly about what it is. I am not going to show you anything about how to develop for analysis services or you know necessarily how it looks i'm just going to try to explain you know what it is for and uh, what it is good for and uh, you know how you are going to you know figure out what is the right version for you and your company so let's just dive into it so what is analysis services or ssas as we have often called it ssas stands for sql server analysis services but you know we are not just talking about SQL Server Analysis Services. So yeah, we'll explain that later. But we, you know, we are used to calling this SSAS, so I'm just going to stick to that a bit. Yeah. So what is it? If you think about it, it is basically a semantic model. And a semantic model is a model where you uh, try to abstract complexity. So basically, uh, in your source systems, you have a bunch of complexity. That complexity can come from many, many things. It can come from you know, you having, you know, a source system that is very normalized. So the database, you can, uh, your source system, there are many of them. And the source system is a web-based tool or it is, you know, Excel or whatever it is. You don't want that uh, complexity to uh, to be presented to your end users. No, we are talking about a semantic model for the analyst, for someone who is actually going to do some analysis or reports on top of the, of the data. So you try to you know, abstract that complexity with that semantic model, which is the base of analysis services. But it's more than a, uh, you know, abstraction of complexity. It's also about having you know, human readable names of attributes. Of course, that you know, links to the abstraction of complexity because you know, in many database systems, at least, you know, the names of columns uh, or attributes, they can be you know, pretty confusing. You know? Some of them are you know, like uh, SAP. They have maybe you know only three, four, five letter uh, you know names for columns, uh, and some of them have you know names that are fit for a database, but necessarily not necessarily fit for a report. So one of the uh, uh, one of the reasons why you have a semantic model is to you know make this more readable and more easier for the end user to use. It is most of the time organized into a star schema. I'm gonna talk about what star schema is a little bit later on. Um, but that's what most of the time it's it's done, and it's at least the best way to do it. But although you're not forced to do that, you know, in in many cases at least, it usually has some kind of a pre-built aggregations and or some other calculations, and this is for uh, both for uh, to help you know with performance, but also just to uh, again abstract complexity for from the uh, for the end user because you know you. It might have sales and you might have cost, but you know, what about gross profit? You know, do you want you know your users to be calculating that, or do you want to calculate that for them? And there are reasons why you want to do that, and I'm going to come back to why you want to do it for people instead of letting them do that themselves. Okay, it's not only a semantic model; it is also uh, usually, or it's always, a combination of one or more data sources. So. You might have multiple data sources for a, a analysis services semantic model, and that is one of the strengths of the uh, of the concept, because uh, it can be very difficult if you need to uh, access data from different sources and put it together. So uh, again, you know, you do that in the model to help the end user, you know, you know, abstract that complexity from the end user. You can also have, or it does have, a highly configurable security model. Um, if you have ever touched on analysis services, um, you might have seen that it has a security model where you can go down to a very, very low granularity. So you can, uh, in some instances, even go down to a cell level security. But you know, it, it's very flexible. Um, you can 
do it, you know, very restrictive or very open. You can do it very flexible using scripts and, you know, queries so that you can do dynamic security um, based on, you know, which would, you know, change depending on who is logged in or what are they looking at or, you know, what group do they belong to. So you can do all kind of, you know, nifty things with the analysis of a security model. It's a little bit different between versions, but basically it can do very similar things, you know, no matter what versions you have. But the main thing here, it is, it is, you know, very easy to secure your data. Well, maybe I should take that back. You know, very easy is, you know, it's a very abstract, you know, thing. You know, for some people it's very easy, for others it's very difficult. But at least it's, you know, the possibilities are really, really great. And this is my first, uh, you know, bullet where I have an asterisk at the end. And so this bullet says faster and easier to use than a relational database. And this is, of course, meant for uh, most business users uh, who are not re now used to using relational databases. Uh, for them, having a semantic model, uh, it's much easier than to having to create a, a database. Um, but it depends, of course, a little bit on, you know, are you, you know, querying the semantic model or are you using a tool that can, you know, drag and drop from a, from a semantic model? But even though you're comparing a, you know, a drag and drop tool for a semantic model like analysis services or, a, you know, a tool that can, uh, you know, where you can do drag and drop from a relational database, it's usually more easier with the analysis services semantic model because there you don't have to think about uh, relations between uh, tables, which you usually have to do in databases. Okay, so that was a what it is. Now let's say why. What is the reason? What, what 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 did it give us? You know, why do we want to have a semantic model? One of the main reasons why we want to have a semantic model is that we have business questions, um, and those business questions are not always very simple, and they don't always you know fit very well to our you know our systems. So here, for example, is a is a question called says so what was the sales for last month? This is a pretty simple question. And this, you know, you might say, okay, I can go into my, you know, into my transactional system or into my, uh, uh, you know, dynamics or whatever, you know, uh, ERP system you have. And I can say, okay, I can look this up. I can look what was a sale. And I can say, you know, for last month, I can usually filter by months. I might even be able to draw out some reports. And this is pretty easy. But this is, you know, a really, you know, this is a simple one, but it's still a one that, you know, uh, it's much more easier to answer with a semantic model. But what if you start thinking, okay, what about, you know, if we want the sales last month by product categories or by, you know, compared to last year? Now we start getting a little bit more complexity into the question and then it gets a little bit more difficult. You know, you still might be able to do and answer these by going into the, you know, relational system, but, you know, it, it's going to be a little bit harder. Of course, if you create a database, you can probably, uh, you know, get this uh, answer as well, but it's, you know, it's not very simple to do for a, for a business user. Now you can do a little bit more complex questions. So what is the gross profit? And what is, the, is it growing or shrinking? Now, in, most of the time, at least in, you know, the systems that I, you know, have worked with, you know, calculations like gross profit are not necessarily uh, done in the source system. So in your ERP system, you know, you might have sales, you might have costs, they might not even be in the same, you know, uh, uh, ledger. Um, and then, you know, you know, if you're looking in the right ledger, you might get both, but will you, will you get the gross profit as well? Maybe if your accounts are set up in that way, but maybe not. And is it growing or shrinking? Then you were talking about trending, you know, comparing it to something, and this gets a little bit more complex. Now, what if we go for even a more complex question? So what is the total cost for each department per employee? And here you might have the issue of, you know, well, the total cost, I can find that in my, you know, ERP system, but departments and how many employees they have, that might be in my HR system, who might be a completely different system. It might even be a web-based system, uh, that I, which, which I, you know, I don't necessarily have, you know, easy access to it. And then I was, you know, then we start saying, you know, okay, now I need to extract data from my AP system. I need to extract data from my HR system. I need to put it into Excel. I need to calculate it, and then I can get it. If you, if instead of, you know, having each, you know, employee doing that, maybe it's better to, you know, extract those data and put it into a semantic model. So this is just to highlight a little bit, you know, what the you know, typical uh, business questions are and you know, why they would, you know, uh, why a semantic model facilitates answers to these. So let's continue a little bit, you know, let's go down to, you know, instead of looking at the questions, what about, you know, just the 
you know, technical and not technical issue about, you know, not having a cementing model. Now, I know some of you might thinking about, okay, he's talking about a data warehouse, but, you know, data warehouse is definitely something that can, you know, do a lot of these things, uh, but the data warehouse does not usually have that, you know, business friendly attribute names and, you know, everything, you know, easily related to each other. So this is like a layer, you know, after that. But one of the issues we have, you know, generally is that there are problems querying source systems. You know, so maybe you, you know, you don't want everyone to have access to your database from your, you know, you know, dynamic system. You don't want everyone to have, you know, uh, access to uh, to different kind of systems to able to get or extract data from and to answer business questions. Uh, you might have, you know, some of the, you know, some main people have it, you know, some of the uh, power users, but not everyone. And you know, you want to get, you know, a lot of these things out to you know the end user so it's not only a few people who can answer questions there might also be multiple systems sources but i have touched on this a little bit before but you know there might be many of them and then if you have many source systems you know you know it is difficult to get all the data together even though you have a data warehouse again you know you you don't necessarily want everyone to be you know querying your data warehouse I worked for a customer which you know had that uh, they decided that a lot of bunch of people were allowed to go into their uh, data warehouse to uh, do queries because they were power users and they were not very proficient at you know writing SQL and um, so the data warehouse simply stopped responding at some time points um, and they had to uh, stop that for a while you know of course the, the, the reason there was uh, the answer there was to educate people properly on SQL um, but you know there is a risk by putting everyone into data warehouses and source system because they can you know have this issues and if you have you know systems like uh, analysis services and semantic models of course you can put them down to the knees as well but at least the business impact is usually less than if you put the uh, you know erp system down or if you put uh, you know the data warehouse down and also there's an issue of, you know, if you want to let people go to against the source system, they can be very hard to query. Even though you are good at, you know, writing SQL, the, they, you know, there's a lot of tables usually in those ERP systems. You know, they are normalized tables where you have uh, each table is as small as it can be. And they have, uh, you know, different tables, you know, that you need to join and maybe you need to join a lot of them. And that's because they're built for write, not for read. So they're not built to be read, you know, out of it, you know, a lot of big uh, amounts of data. They're built to write really, really fast. So we really don't want to necessarily people to be querying ad hoc queries against uh, source systems. So you want to move that away from there, you know, into a data warehouse and then hopefully into a semantic model as well. And then, of course, the main point about a, in a semantic model, this is probably the biggest uh, reason why you want to have a semantic model. If you don't, you, have, you might at least get into the situation that is, you know, you get inconsistencies in interpreting business rules. So I used to work for a company and we decided to build a finance, uh, financial uh, data mart and uh, semantic model. And it took, you know, this was like, this is not a very big company, three and a half thousand employees, operations around the world, but they took a whole week, people, you know, eight people sitting in a room just to do, uh, to, you know, agree on uh, what the definitions were for different things. You know, even things like net sales was difficult, but then there is much more complex, you know, things, you know, because there's always, uh, there's always this kind of a, um you know politics and infighting you know you need to make the sure you have those basic rules you know in place and if you have them and you need to get them for to be able to create a semantic model you put the rules into the model so there's no way people can then you know have their own version of that business rule so you agree on them you put them into a model and then everyone uses the same rules so this is the the very famous you know single version of the truth although you know that is probably uh, a utopia to think that you can get all the way there, but at least this is a you know a really really big step there. So these are the main reasons why you want the semantic model. Um, you want it because it abstracts uh, you know complexities, and you want it because you know there is not very not necessarily a good idea to let your users access uh, source systems um, directly. Okay, so that was the why. Now just to have a little roundup of this. Remember, semantic model abstracts complexity. 
it has human readable names or attributes, and it's organized into star schema. Remember I told you I was gonna tell you a little bit about what star schema is. And this is important because uh, analysis services love star schema. And a star schema is a you know a way where you can model your data into uh, two types of tables. And on the image on the right here, you will see that there are green tables and there are blue table. And this is what are called dimensions and facts. And uh, dimensions, the green tables, they are uh, descriptive fields. So in this case, the fact, which is the num number of fields, is a ticket sales. And if you look at the, uh, at the uh, uh, here you will see that the purchase total is our measure. So we decided we wanna measure how much did you no, buy for? That is our measure and that's in the fact table. The green tables or the dimension tables, they are describing that purchase. So which customer did it? You know, what the venue was it for? What was the date of the purchase? And what event was it that the ticket was purchased for? So the green tables or dimensions, they are uh, descriptive, while the fact table has only numeric fields. So now in this case, purchase total, sales, cost, whatever it is. And then they have a link to each and every one of those tables. So you have the venue ID that links to the venue, you have the customer ID that links to the customer and so on and so forth. Usually the, uh, the fact tables, they have, you know, those IDs, they are what we call a uh, you know, surrogate ID. So they are numbers. Uh, so the uh, fact table includes only numbers. And this is important because for the fact table, it's the big table. So you might have even have you know 10,000 or 20,000 customers or 100,000 or 500,000 customers. Doesn't really matter. Uh, that is the small table because hopefully at least your transactions, the tickets you've sold, they are millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions or you know billions even. So what you have when you have a dimensional model, you have all those big big uh, columns which have you know text values in them which take a lot of space. They are in tables where they are unique or at least you know semi unique they they're not always because you do some kind of you do some denormalization but at least they are not repeated you know hundreds of millions of times but they may be you know repeated thousands of times and but you have your your table that is repeated you know and it has millions or tens or hundreds of millions of rows that is consist of mostly numbers and numbers you know they take a much less space in your database and are much much for faster to uh, look up than you know text. So when you compare this to a you know ERP system or a you know transactional system, they you are usually uh, have a lot of tables that you know you will have you know a a transaction that has a customer that has an address that has you know a, some other attributes and there are tables and tables and tables and tables because that's much more faster to write into. This is optimized for reading. Because you have, you know, your big table with only uh, numbers in it, you know, and your uh, uh, your you know descriptive tables, and they are smaller, it may be much more faster. And also, if you think about how you often often use reports, or you know, when you're doing uh, some kind of a uh, you know an analysis on a data set, you usually want to select the filter first, and then you want to have the value. And that means that you know your filters are coming from the dimension tables, and they are smaller. So it's much more faster to get, you know, a single customer and then filter all the transactions based on that instead of having one big table, which you will always need to filter each, you know, everything in the table each and every time. So this is a star schema. This is something that you uh, definitely should you be using if you are using analysis services. Every versions of analysis services love this. Some will require it, uh, but you know, this is always going to be the fastest and the best way to to present data into uh, analysis services. So that was star schema. And then the last thing was, you know, pre aggregation and or other calculations. And I'm gonna get to that a little bit later on in more detail. So this is, you know, what, you know, analysis services is. Now let's go in and check it out what, you know, what types of analysis services, are, you know, exist out there. So there are basically two flavors of analysis services. Now, I don't know, you know, this is really difficult because there's two flavors and three versions. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking flavors and versions, call it what you want, but at least, you know, uh, this is what I'm calling it. So the two flavors of analysis services are analysis services multidimensional and analysis services tabular. 
now let's dive into what they are and how they differ from each other. So analysis of a multidimensional has a multidimensional semantic model or OLAP. Uh, if you have ever uh, heard about you know analysis services, you must have heard the word OLAP. Um, it's online uh, analytic processing. It's a very old word for analysis services or you know these types of system. Um, multidimensional semantic models are, are a little bit different than the normal uh, you know models because they uh, you are always looking for an intersection of dimensions and facts or whatever you can also refer to as a cube now remember you know this is a multi-dimensional so this can have many many dimensions now, normally when you look at the table in a database you have two dimensions you have rows and you have columns excel has rows and columns then it has the third dimension which is sheets uh, analysis services multi-dimensional can have you know lots of dimensions i'm not even sure that there is any kind of restriction i think there must be but i have never ever gotten close to it so if you think about how a cube works you know if you look at this image here of the cube here um, you can see that you know i have a source dimension here on the on the uh, on the left hand side uh, and this is uh, uh, telling me you know where my you know my you know, uh, packages are coming from i have a root on the top and i have time at the bottom so this is three dimensions and we as humans we have very hard time looking at anything more than three dimensions so this is why we always you know explain this in three dimensions but if you look at the number here you know 240 which is here at the top right hand corner of the uh, of the cube this is telling me that you know there were 250 and 40 packages for africa by air on december 1st 99 which is in the fourth quarter so this the value is the intersection of all the different you know, dimensions in the cube. This is one of the things that makes a multidimensional pretty hard to uh, to learn and to work with because you need to think in those dimensions and you can stack dimensions. So you can have, you know, like I say, 10 dimensions easily, uh, you know, stacked on top of each other, which makes it a little bit hard to query. Now, luckily, you know, a lot of the tools we have to, you know, to work with analysis services multidimensional will abstract this from you so you can just put things in there and it works like you know you for you it's like you're working with uh, a two-dimensional source but uh, if you need to write queries or you need to develop a model you will most you will need to understand this concept and you need to work with it you know it doesn't you know really help you a lot you know when you're working with it it is widely implemented mature technology, meaning that you know this has been around for a long time, or since 1998. And before that, you know, Microsoft bought this in 1998. You know, before that, it was also you know uh, running. Um, so this is you know a very you know widely implemented mature technology. There are you know millions of companies around the world that have implemented the analysis service multidimensional. Um, so, so it is very, very proven technology that's been there for long. And it has been the de facto uh, enterprise tool for Microsoft, uh, you know, analysis over Microsoft uh, modeling for BI for you know tens of years. Although that is changing, it has the MDX query language, and the MDX query language is the you know is a query language where you can write queries against this multidimensional. And the first instance you might you know this might look as a SQL. You know, have a you have a select, and you have a from, and you have a where. But they also have something like the on zero and on one. And this is like on the first dimension and on the second dimension. And in this case, the first dimension is the columns, and the second dimension is the rows. So this is very easy. This is represented as a, a as a you know tabular model, but you can have multiple more other dimensions uh, and then they will just stack on uh, on your uh, rows and columns when you have the output but when you're writing it you need to think in those uh, in as uh, at it as a cube now mdx is one of the reason why a lot of people have struggled with analysis in multidimensional it you know it's perceived as very hard um, it because you know people come with sql background and then they find this one completely different or they come with excel background and find this you know very very hard or programming background that this is different than that as well but you know as with every language you know you can learn it you know if you want and you go you know it just takes a little bit of time but it has been a, a bit of a stumbling block for a you know a self-service implementation of analysis services 
which means that our analysis of is multidimensional has been mostly a developer uh, tool uh, to develop uh, those uh, uh, semantic models that then people can work with you know in a self-service capacity it has file-based storage meaning that you know the data is stored on disk you need to have you know a lot of io to and you know, need to have fast disks for this to be fast and um, of course you know this used to be a bigger problem but today we have a lot of you know very fast uh, ssd disks but of course they cost money if you have a lot of data this you know, you know, could be a, a you know a bit of a stumbling block they also have something called aggregations uh, aggregations are where you will build uh, uh, aggregations before you know so you will uh, need to uh, build them yourself or you can you know base them off queries that have been before so for example you know you have data down to uh, the day level and then uh, but you know you know that people will mostly be looking at the month level uh, on product groups not product so you can build a aggregation that says sales for months for product groups and then that can be uh, you know uh, retrieved really fast by the engine so i say you can build those you know manually because you know what people are after or you can you know uh, uh, you can trace, so we basically collect all the data and all the queries that come into the system for a while, and then you can make an analysis of build aggregations automatically based on those queries. So if there is a typical, you know, two weeks of you know of queries, you can then you know make analysis of build those aggregations and make it faster, because aggregations they are cast uh, either into the Windows cache or into the memory, so they are going to be re retrieved really really fast uh, or much faster at least than data from uh, from file. Uh, or from you know from disk it has a pretty rigid structure remember i showed you this picture before and in analysis services multidimensional you need to tell analysis services if a table is a dimension or if it is a fact because you know analysis services will work with it differently depending on if it is a dimension or a fact so you need to have a, a star schema of a sort at least just for analysis service to work multidimensional sorry so that was multidimensional let me jump over to tabular so tabular is the other flavor it's the new kids on the block well not quite new but it has been there for a shorter time analysis of tabular has a tabular semantic model meaning that you know you are instead of thinking of it as a cube you can just think of it as tables it makes it much much easier for us to uh, to understand the semantic model and to work with it it has uh, you know all tables are equal so you don't have that uh, you know where you have to have a fact table and a dimension table Although analysis service tabular loves a star schema or a dimensional model because it's just much, much more faster working with it. You don't have to have it. And, you know, analysis service doesn't care what type of table it is. It's just a table. And instead of having, you know, intersections of uh, dimensions and facts uh, in, you know, in the cube, in the way we have in the multidimensional, in tabular, you just have relationships between table and that allows your queries to go and navigate between tables after the, or by those relationships. So you don't have to, you, know, you can travel in, you know, in, you, know, you can define a relationship in any direction, and then the uh, queries can travel those just to get, you know, uh, to get your result. Uh, while in the you know, analysis services, uh, multidimensional, you will only always get a result from the fact table, and then the descriptive from the dimensions. You know, in tabular model, it doesn't, you know, care. You can get results from each and every table. It doesn't matter. It is based on the Wurzelbeck engine, which was later called, you know, X Velocity, um, or AKA Power Pivot, which was introduced in Excel 2010. So if you have ever worked with Power Pivot in Excel, that is analysis services tabular. It's exactly the same, you know, engine underneath. Um, you know, so basically, you know, underneath Excel there is a tabular model. Um, so if you have ever worked with it, you, you will know something. And if you ever work with analysis services tabular, you can take that know-how and you know put it to work in, you know, Power Pivot. Um, this also means that you know, this is not very old technology, but it is still, you know, still at least 10 years old. So it is not uh, quite new either. Um, so the re just to just to give a little bit of a historical perspective here. So the reason why Microsoft did, used, uh, did this was that you know where I mentioned a little bit before, you know, multidimensional is a bit hard to learn and it's a bit hard to work with. So uh, a true self-service uh, BI couldn't be, you know gotten there with the only analysis service because you always have to have the uh, developers or the IT people working with 
uh, of the semantic model before the uh, end users couldn't work on it. So Macta wanted to do something where a business user could also create the model and also work with the model and as well as the analysis that came afterwards. So they created Power Pivot. Um, of course, Power Pivot was fantastic and is fantastic. It allow you to do you know, millions of rows in Excel. But especially if you had, you know, 32-bit Excel, you could, could only have an Excel, you know, threads that could be one gigabyte of memory. And because everything is in memory here, uh, you know, your computer suddenly became the, you know, uh, you know the, the bottleneck. So Microsoft introduced a, a power pivot for SharePoint, which allow you to uh, take your models, you know, put them onto SharePoint, and SharePoint was running that power pivot model underneath. So you could use a server instead of using your own computer. So that was a little bit better. But they understood that you know it wouldn't. Not everyone had SharePoint, and not everyone wanted to have SharePoint. So instead, they decided to uh, create a tabular model server, and they put it just next to uh, you know multi-dimensional in analysis services. So that is the history why we got there. Power Pivot, sorry, analysis services tabular has the DAX query language, same as Power Pivot. The DAX query language is totally different from uh, MDX, which is the multidimensional you know, uh, query language. Um, it is a mix of Excel commands or Excel uh, formulas, sorry, uh, and its own you know, query language. So it has a bunch of things that look a lot like Excel, but it has other things that are you know, the, you know, more complex because they need to do work on a database instead of just working on a table. Um, most of the time, people find DAX to be easier than uh, than MTX, and uh, they can get much more faster to you know get started working with uh, DAX than they can with MTX. Um, and that especially if they come from the Excel side of the world, so the analysts, you know, those who Microsoft wanted to target, they they find it easier. While people who come from the SQL world, they sometimes find you know it equally hard to go to DAX as to MTX. So ask a quick question about yep. that from one of the attendees. So that yep. data, the underlying data, would that sit in the data warehouse or where would that be located? Well, that is a ideal, yes. So that is something that you know you ideally want to have that you know your data is in a data warehouse and then your semantic model being it multidimensional or tabular it would be created on top of that. Um, but you know, ideal world doesn't always exist. So in theory, it can come from wherever you want it to be. In analysis services, what 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 the analysis services model does is you know it will uh, periodically you know you decide what the you know what the refresh frequency is, but when the, you know you trigger a refresh, it will read the data from the source and put it into the model. So it will actually move the data into the model, and that's both for analysis of multidimensional and tabular. While in multidimensional and tabular, they will both write it to a disk, but the tabular model will put all the data into memory as well. Um, so hopefully that you know answers the question. So it it, it can be worth forever, but you know ideally it's from a data warehouse. Thank you. So as I just said, the data goes into an in-memory cache instead of being you know, stored on the disk. Of course, it is stored on the disk as well. It doesn't you know you don't lose it if you know the computer turns off or the server, but uh, it is you know put into memory, meaning it's going to be really fast. Uh, you also of course need enough memory to put the data in. But power uh, analysis services tabular is built on a columnar database. So the you know X velocity or Vertipack engine is a columnar database which has really really good compression. So in ideally you know ideal situation it can go you know to one in ten compression. Uh, sometimes it's less, um, but you know it depends a little bit on your data. But it can do a lot of compression. So you might have a uh, you know 10 gigabytes you know worth of data but you know when it's in you know analysis service tabular it's only one gigabyte of of, of, of model um, so you can you know it will even though you need a bit of memory it's still not as much as your data uh, is it has a bit of a you know a little more a little more loose structure you know i have an asterisk there as well because in yes it has a little bit more loose but it you know it, you don't have to have you know uh, you know dimensions and fact tables you can just have tables and it is simpler than multidimensional. That is the general consensus. Now, I'm not saying that everyone will think that, but it is, you know, a general consensus that it is simpler than the multidimensional. Okay, so these are the, well, were the two flavors. So you have multidimensional and you have a uh, tabular, but you also have like three versions of it. So now I know that, you know, it's getting a little bit complex, but you know, you have three ways you can install it. Let's just say that, or, you know, yeah, you know, requested. 
So you have SQL Server Analysis Services or SSAS. That is the one that you know uh, is the original one. It has analysis service multidimensional and it has analysis service tabular. But you also have something called Azure Analysis Services. Uh, Azure Analysis Services is a platform as a service, uh, uh, you know, service in Azure. Uh, and then you have Power BI Premium, which is a you know very recently you can then say that is also a proper uh, analysis services even though it's in power bi and it's called power bi premium so i'm going to dive into those uh, all of them uh, a little bit in just you know a few minutes so let's go first and look at sql server analysis services so sql server analysis services is part of the sql uh, install so you simply you know you need to have a sql install uh, install to install the analysis services uh, you run the SQL install the same way as you want to you know, install SQL Server. It installs on a server or a virtual machine. So basically, it's you know it's something that you manage. You know, it's your own server or your own VM that you decide where it is. It has comes in two licenses, either a standard or an enterprise license, just the same as SQL Server. And you now bear in mind that you know even though you have a license for SQL Server, it doesn't mean that you have a you know it does mean that you have a license for analysis service. It's the same license. But you know, SQL Server is licensed per you know a VM or per you know core or depending on what your license is. So you need to make sure that you have a license for that. Um, but it's exactly the same license and it's exactly the same install media. It is fully managed by you, so it's up to you to take care of the server, uh, to maintain it, to update you know the software and everything. You know, it's it's on you. When you install it, you can choose between multidimensional tabular. Um, I don't know if you how well you can see this, but you know, I have you know uh, three versions basically I can install here. I can install multidimensional and data and the data mining mode. I'm not going to cover data mining mode because that's a technology that is you know hasn't been there sorry for a while. Um, it is there still sorry, but it hasn't you know been updated for a long time. It is a, you know there are much better options out there for data mining, but you get it with multidimensional when you install it. Um, Tabular mode, of course, and then power pivot mode, which is the one I talked about a little bit before. If you want to install that, you are installing the power pivot engine for SharePoint. That is what you're doing there. So you can just choose whatever you want there, and then you can go on. It can be installed side by side. So basically, you can install multidimensional and uh, uh, tabular side by side. One of them needs to be a named instance. You can also install analysis services side by side with you know a SQL uh, you know engine or integration services, reporting services, all those other services, but it's not necessarily recommended. But it depends a little bit on you know, how big your model is. You know, is it very big? Probably should have its own server. If it's you know, small, it might you know, work next to each other. But you know, it's, for demo purposes, you can install both you know, analysis of a multidimensional and tabular on the same server, and then you know, if you want to play around with it. If you want to develop for it, you need SQL Server Data Tools, which is a Visual Studio uh, development environment. It's a separate download from the normal Visual Studio, but you can you know, use it for this. And that is uh, you know, used for developing analysis services. So this is a, you know, a little bit of a, you can say, a hindrance for uh, you know, business users, you know, you know, data analysts and others to develop uh, uh, tabular models, even though they can technically you know, understand the models and the DAX you know, language, is sometimes the SQL Server data tools or Visual Studio gets so you know it's too intimidating for people. Um, so that's something that you know a trade-off you need to think about. You know, do you want to go down that road or not? Multidimensional has been around there for over 20 years since 1998, and it's been you know in every you know every uh, versions of SQL Server since SQL Server 7. Um, while SQL the analysis of the tabular has been there for since 2012. And I would say from 2014 it became really good. From 2016 it was really, really good. And since then, that's you know, it's, it's the is the you know go-to version. I'm going to go to, you know to that you know in just short while. Okay, that was analysis services, SQL Server analysis services. Then you have an Azure analysis services. That is only tabular models. So it's a platform as a service uh, in. Uh, Azure, where you can simply uh, get, uh, you know, you just uh, now, uh, requested a, you know, a analysis services, Azure analysis services. You don't have to think about anything. It will just set up, and you just have to make sure that you, uh, you know, of course, you know, you know, have the right size, and you know, and you need to take care of the models and everything like that. But the platform behind it, you know, Microsoft will take care of that for you. 
it is sized in tiers. So you can, you know, you don't, cannot decide that I want this much memory and this many CPUs. It is only in tiers. So for example, if you look at, you know, on the table in the bottom there, if you look at S1, it has 25 gigabytes of memory. And if you look at S9, it has 400 gigabytes of memory. This is the maximum. So you cannot go you know, higher than 400 gigabytes of memory in the in analysis services, Azure analysis services. If you look at the price column, you see that it's built by, by the hour. And that means something cool because you can pay for usage, you can turn it off to save money. Now be careful, of course, you know, you don't want to turn it off uh, during you know, off hours. So you, if you have it turned on during business hours and turn it off after that, you know, you, you, know, you have to make sure that you know, don't have it off when someone is doing a month and reporting and they need it you know, in the evening. So that is, of course, something you need to be careful with. Uh, but you, potentially you can you know, turn it off you know, during holidays and, uh, and the nights and whatever, you know, especially if you're only operating in one region, it can save you quite a bit of money. So that is Azure Analysis Services. It is basically as tabular models, except that it is a platform as a service, it's sized in tiers, and you pay for the usage. Now, Power BI Premium is also analysis services. When it comes to uh, the data models, so not when it comes to the reporting part, so that's completely you know, separate, but you know, when you think about data sets and, 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 and the data, how the data is stored, that is basically analysis services, and you can think of it as analysis services because that's what it is. It of course has only tabular mode, mode. so you, you don't have any multidimensional in Power BI. Um, if you're using Power BI Desktop to uh, to to uh, you know develop Power BI reports, you, underneath the hood on Power BI Desktop there is a, a tabular model or analysis services tabular engine. Um, so uh, a Power BI Premium is simply a Azure analysis servers a server where you know where you are publishing your Power BI models to. So it has only tabular mode. It is platform as a service, exactly the same as Azure Analysis Services. And as I say, this is basically Azure Analysis Service underneath when you have Power BI Premium. When you don't have Power BI Premium, just Power BI Normal, and then you are on a shared capacity. So that's why you cannot do all these fancy uh, tabular model work uh, because uh, you don't have your own Azure Analysis Server. It is sized in tiers in the pretty much the same tiers as, uh, as Azure Analysis Services. So you just go on ahead and uh, you know pick a tier. And recently they have you know have managed to uh, they have you know made it public preview, so you can go all the way up to an S9 where you can get the 400 gigabytes. And this is very important. Power BI Premium is this superset of analysis services. What does that mean? That means that you know Power BI Premium is the you know the first one to get all the updates and it's the the one that you know is going to be the main one in the future but it's still azure analysis services sql server analysis services they are there to stay and they're going to be there for a long time because there are so many installations all over the world and microsoft have committed to having them all running for a long time so don't worry about it okay so what should you choose now we have told you what it is what should you choose should you choose a multidimensional tabular or Power BI Premium. So why choose multidimensional? If you have a really large amount of data, multidimensional is the only way to go. So there is a, you know, if you have a, a server somewhere, a, you know, a Windows server, it can only support so much memory. So I think something like two terabytes of memory or something like that, that, you know, SQL Server can handle. And, you know, if you have a model that's bigger than that, you know, you cannot, you know, uh, you, you cannot, you know, put that into memory. So tabular is out of the way there, but because multidimensional is file-based, uh, file it can support huge amount of data. If you want to use something called actions, they're a pretty cool thing, you know, part of the multidimensional, you can, you know, that is another reason. So I'm not gonna, you know, go into it. This is something that you should you know, read about if you are, you know, seriously taking this decision of what to choose. But actions are a pretty cool part of multidimensional, which allow you to, allow the user to, you know, trigger all kind of different things. It has something called custom rollups that no other version has, which is basically, so if you look at the the image here on the right, uh, you have, uh, oh, sorry, you have the you know sales revenue, cost of goods sold, and you have cross profit all on the same level, but this one should be, you know, 
this one minus this one here. So if it's on the same level, you know, analysis service cannot just calculate that because it's usually calculating the, you know, all the children of sales revenue are the sales revenue and so on and so forth. But in the cost of rollup, you can decide, you know, formulas on a different levels in a different hierarchies. It's a very cool feature as well. It has many to many relationships. I have put an asterisk there because the analysis of his tabular has just gotten that. It has something called name sets and it has something called scope, scope statements. Now, if you are a financial organization or something that you know needs complex financial calculations, usually you know multidimensional is the only way to go because it has the opportunity within the DAC, in MDX language to write very complex statements that you know DAX cannot you know do at the moment. So, the asterisk is there because some of it has been solved with tabular model calculation groups, but not all of it has. So these are the reasons why you should choose multidimensional. A note of warning, there has been very, very, very few new features in multidimensional since SQL Server 2012. Microsoft is committed to supporting it, but it's not being developed a lot. The, really, the only things that you see in, you know, in development are more than things like, you know, how does it better support Power BI? Uh, with, which you know shoots DAX statements into you know, MPX statements and you know, all something like that is something that is happening now, but it's very mature, very stable, so you can still go for it. Uh, but there are you know you just need to keep that in mind. So why do you use uh, SSS tabular or uh, Azure Analysis Services? It has usually faster development time because it's it's usually easier to develop. You know this is with an asterisk again because you know nothing is certain here. It has faster response time almost always. There are, you know, there are uh, instances where it does not have faster response times if you have really, really good SSD disk on the multidimensional. But you know, most of the time it has faster response time because you have the data in, in memory. It's much, you know, it's better. DAX is easier than MDX. That's at least uh, what the majority of people say. It is future-proof because it is, uh, uh, you know, something that Microsoft is developing really, really, you know, a lot on. It is very versatile. You can have it on premises or you can have it in the cloud as a platform as a service. So you can decide and you can very easily switch between them. You can very easily migrate from analysis services in on-premise to analysis services in Azure. Now, why would you choose Power BI Premium? The Power BI Premium is a superset of analysis services. That means that the Power BI Premium has all the features of analysis services plus some of its own. Now, this is not strictly true at the moment because Power BI Premium is still catching up, but that is what it is going to be. So it's going to have all the all the features of Azure analysis services and SQL analysis services, uh, tabular models, but it's going to have more features. And it does actually have features now that uh, analysis service tabular doesn't have, but you know it also is lacking in some respects at the moment. So it's this is you know, what I'm talking about. The new features come first to Power BI Premium, then to Azure Analysis Services, and then to SQL Server Analysis Services. If you need or want any other Power BI Premium features, it might be better for you to just buy Power BI Premium instead of buying Power BI Premium and an Azure Analysis Services or SQL Server Analysis Services. You might save some money there. It also has something cool called multi-memory management, multi-model memory management. So in Analysis Services, you know you need to have memory to fit your models, all your models into it. In Power BI Premium, you can, you know, Power BI Premium has this engine behind that will switch things out from, take it out of the memory if it's not being used and put it into memory if it's being used. So you can have models that are bigger than your total amount of memory. But, you know, of course, the models that are being put into memory, they might be a little bit slower. It has something called composite models, and I'm just going to, you know, ask you to read about that if you're interested. Uh, it has aggregations, you know, similar as I talked about in, in multidimensional, you know, tabular models don't have that. And it has incremental refresh, which is pretty cool because you know when you want to do that in tabular models or in uh, multi-dimensional models, you can, but you need to program it, which can be a little bit difficult. But it's very simple in Power BI Premium. And it has something called bring your own key, which you know if you need to encrypt your data with you know your own key, uh, then Azure Analysis Services might be a little bit you know difficult for you. But you know in Power BI Premium you can bring your own encryption key with you. Okay, so the answer is. It depends, of course, you know, on the amount of data, on the functionality requirements, on the visualization and analysis tool you're going to put on top of it, and on the skill level of the developers, and on the budget, of course. That's the in that. And it also depends on the previous investment in technology. Do you have running analysis of a multidimensional? Now everyone knows how to use it. Maybe you just stick with that, or you know, you're starting from scratch. Maybe you can start with you know Power BI Premium. 
so the principle I work with is, you know, I will always start from there. Does Power BI Premium work for me? Yes, go for that. Does a national level work for me? Yes, go for that. Does SSS tabular work for me? Go for that. Does SSS multidimensional world work for me? Go for that. So this is the order I evaluate them in because I go from what is new and you know being worked on uh, down to the ones that are older. But sometimes I end up in a multidimensional because that's the technology that is most strongest and, and by far the, you know, the most mature. So hopefully this gave you some interesting uh, ideas about what an analog service is and what you, uh, you know, how you should choose your own version. So Ben, do we have any questions? Um, yes, first of all, I want to make sure you learn something very important because I took the time to look it up. A multidimensional database can have a little more than two billion dimensions, so please make sure not to build more than that. I want to, oh, okay. I I'm kind of curious how that would look. I'm this close to actually bimbling it just to make sure to see how this would look in Visual Studio. And I may yeah. start at two million instead of two billion, it would probably kill it. Um, so yeah, that, that is one of those theoretical limits that we will um, never reach. Still, we had a couple of other questions. Um, first of all, Nick, if your question was an answer, um, please get back to us. Um, one simply has no question. Can Power BI connect to a multi-dimensional database? Yes, it can. That's probably not. See, I, I was going probably, you could probably go with it depends, but um, there we go. No, it just works fine. You know, it, it, it might not be as fast as against the, you know, an analysis service tabular, but it works fine with multi-dimensional. Okay, perfect. Does analysis services work in memory? See, there we go with it depends. Yeah, so if you have multidimensional, it's partially in memory. If you go for tabular, fully in memory, Power BI Premium, fully in memory, because that's a tabular model. Perfect. Couple of just comments um, about an amazing um, session. And one last question, what are the primary visualization tools for analysis services? Well, I would say, you know, there are, there are you know, a lot of the companies that are doing visualizations, they have built their reputation on working on analysis services. You know, you can think of things as, you know, Tableau and Excel and, uh, uh, you know, Panorama and all these different tools, you know, that are just, you know, have a specialized tool that works with analysis services. So there are a lot of them. And I would say most tools, you know, BI tools in the world work with uh, analysis services. Uh, I would say almost everyone, you know, I don't think I've ever, you know, seen a tool that doesn't do it. Some of them, you know, they work better with their own models, but most of them can do it. Okay. No more questions. So thank you very much. Pleasure listening to you as always. And I will hand over to our next moderator, John, who will be moderating the final two sessions of the day. Take Hi, the thanks, Ben. Thanks for the handover. Yeah, um, that was a great session on uh, the introduction to analysis services. It crops up everywhere. I didn't realize it was in... Um, you know, Excel and um, Power BI and and it's just everywhere. <laughs> well, you can do you can use everything against analysis services. It's such a you know an old and you know mature you know tool that you know you say let's say most you know BI tools they have been built upon working with analysis services. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so uh, um. At five o'clock, we have serverless mobile database access with Azure functions. And I don't know how to say this word. I never get to, it's, is it Zaramin at, um, and Azure SQL DB? And at six o'clock, we're rebooting your data analysis strategy with the Pair platform and Office 365. So if you, um, you know, if you had your fill of analysis services, two excellent um, uh, sessions coming up. Fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna, you know, bid you farewell and uh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I, I love this, you know, this concept is fantastic and, you know, I, and I think it's going to be a hit.